I'm going to kick us off because we have a lot to cover. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Vicky Clark. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the policy director with Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes. Um, we are excited to have you with us for this four-day virtual event. This is day three. The final day is on Monday. You get the weekend off. Um, we're thrilled to see folks from so many communities around the state and beyond join us for this session and some of the other sessions. Um, I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement. The summit is virtual and those participating and joining us from many lands, Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes are two statewide organizations. And we acknowledge the land our offices in the Puget Sound sit on today as the traditional homes of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot and Suquamish tribal nations. If you don't know whose land you're on, look in the chat in a minute where you'll find a link to a map you can use to look up your place on the land. Without these communities, we would not have access to this environment. And we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. Also want to note that we're recording this session uh, along with the others and it will all be available after the summit. Uh, the summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two statewide sister organizations with a shared vision of safe and healthy futures, where a safe and healthy future, <laughs> where bicycles bring people together, eliminate inequity and create thriving, thriving communities. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington state, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclist rights, endorses political candidates for office, holds officials accountable and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, um, the Washington State Department of Transportation, Columbia Bank and Dero. Uh, our sponsors' collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 14 panels with expert speakers, registration free for all attendees. And with that, I am excited to introduce our panelists and our uh, panel for the next hour. So first of all, our panelists, I want to introduce Amanda Warner with Family Bike Seattle, Brian Watson with West Sound Cycling Club, Jessica Levine with Seattle Public Schools, Sarah Collin also with Seattle Public Schools, and Michelle Solis, who is a bike to school advocate. Quick description. So biking to school fosters autonomy and independence. We all know that. Uh, young people get to go from personal choice to institutional change to create more resilient and accessible communities. Uh, join us today with experts from Seattle Public Schools and around the Puget Sound region as they share stories of challenges and wins in empowering youth to bike to school. Um, and with that, uh, oh, I have one more thing that I should say, which is we, we this is a presentation. We have several speakers. Um, we're going to talk. They're going to talk for around 50 minutes. The last section is audience q and I want to invite people now and throughout the session to post your questions for these awesome speakers in the chat. We will collect all of those questions and ask them all at the end. Um, so do ask your questions. And with that, I want to hand over to... I believe I'm handing over to Jessica. Yes, thank Thanks. you. Awesome. Great. Well, we're so glad to have everybody here today. Um, we are three from Seattle Public Schools. Um, I'm representing the teacher uh, aspect of that. Um, you'll hear from Michelle Solis, our parent volunteer and school advocate, and um, also from Sarah Collings, who's in a new role um, with Seattle Public Schools. And we're really excited to be here today talking about students' path to access and independence as they learn to ride their bikes to school. Um, and what we're going to cover is those three perspectives from one from each of us. Again, uh, Michelle is the parent. I, I am a teacher here in Seattle Public Schools, and um, and Sarah is going to represent the sort of district level initiatives as we try to scale up some of the work that we've been doing at our school here. And she'll also talk about some of the other work that we've been doing throughout the district in other schools. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle now, who is our parent volunteer, who's kind of come up through the whole program. And you're going to hear her story uh, and how she's empowering youth to bike to school. Thanks, Michelle. Hi. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I was involved in, I became involved as a parent advocate for biking and walking to school when my son began elementary school 10 years ago. And I was, I've just been involved in continuing the momentum of programs that were already put in place. 
Now, as I understand it at Bryant Elementary, which is a neighborhood school, um, the parents who began this sort of programming tell the genesis of the idea of shifting or increasing, uh, or making a bike culture and a walking culture at that school. They tell this, it began um, on the day that they were walking to school with their daughter on her first day of kindergarten. And as they're walking, they're meeting other families who are also walking to school. But then as they get closer to the school, they encounter a situation that I think many of you will recognize. The streets become clogged with cars, there's exhaust, kids are darting, you know, making unsafe crossings. And they were just really struck by this and then set out to see what they could do to change the culture. And I think the underlying principle is if you can make biking and walking normal and safe, then more people will join in. And the more visibility you can have for these alternative methods of transportation, the safer it will become. You'll raise awareness and you'll increase safety. That can have trickle down effects to everyone who lives in the neighborhood. Anyway, so using um, money received from the Seattle Department of Transportation Safe Routes to School grants, we began programming at Bryant that was focused on walking in October, Walktober. Um, that <clears throat> um, for that we would have stations set up around the school, a few blocks away from the school, where people could meet for a treat, a prize, and then walk to school together a few blocks. Um, but the real crown jewel of all this programming was was Bike to School Month in May. And there were activities throughout the month um, that included things like free bike tune-ups, a real favorite for parents who are pulling these bikes out of the garage that maybe didn't fit their kids anymore. Um, prizes for kids, the kids track their trips, um, prizes uh, for who biked the most or which teachers biked the most, which classrooms biked the most, group rides like the one shown here where we met at a local donut shop and then rode to school together. And then also another favorite was a uh, bike ferry Friday, where um, if the bike ferry catches you biking to school, you win a prize. Um, and so the students, you know, when asked, they said things like, you know, what did they like about biking to school? Some said the challenge of the hills, Bryant is on a hill. So one said they like the morning exercise and you get to improve your biking skills. Another said, you know, I, I get to see things that are invisible from a car. And then, of course, another one said they love the downhill ride home. Um, and so then uh, going on to middle school, um, when my children began middle school at Eckstein, um, I, again, just sort of slotted in on those. Oh, could you change the slide, please, Jessica? Thank you. Um, I, I, I began to help out with those events that had, again, sort of been established by parents who were ahead of me. And um, there it's focused on biking to school, building a bike culture. And what's really different about doing this in middle school is that um, we are talking with the students. You know, in grade school, I found myself talking a lot with parents about biking to school. But in middle school, it is is completely student focused. These students are choosing to ride their bikes on their independently. And man, they come loaded down. Like, have you seen a backpack lately? Like those are huge. And then they usually have a musical instrument or sports equipment or both. And Eckstein is also on the top of a hill. So these kids are impressive. And so our events, <clears throat> we take, you know, take place at the Eckstein bike cage, which you see in the picture there. That's where they park their bikes, but then during our events, it is a natural clubhouse um, for, and usually we are giving breakfasts or hot apple cider or donuts. In May, we do a big pancake breakfast. We, uh, at least once a year, have offered free bike tune-ups. And then, of course, if we are <clears throat> encouraging the students to bike to school, we need to make sure that they can do so safely. And so we give um, we uh, have free lights, free reflective gear, um, helmets, maps. Um, so that that is a part of where, again, it's Safe Routes to School uh, money from SDOT that we use to buy that sort of equipment. And then also another event that we do um, is uh, we're trying to kick 
get started up again is offer a bike valet service for the nights when a lot of people come to the school, like science nights or like last night curriculum night. Um, and then a, a great another great thing about Eckstein is that the school has several adaptive bikes, which has allowed a lot of special education students to participate um, in our events in the morning. They're able to ride and, and join in on donut breakfasts or whatever it is that we're doing. So that was just fantastic. Last year, many of them joined in and it was a treat. Now, I think part of the strength of Eckstein's uh, program has been that we have a person on the inside, and that is Jessica. You know, middle school is just three years long. Parent turnover is pretty quick. And so to have a consistent uh, voice for biking, it really helps to have a teacher or staff member um, at the school. And Jessica is that person for X time. Sarah, we can't hear the sound now. We'll, we'll get this, we'll get this. In practice, it works great, right? Yeah. This is good. Mean Green Levine Machine Bicycle Queen. <laughs> My six and a half mile bike commute brings me as the crow flies to the Ravenna Wedgwood neighborhood where I work at a large public middle school. I was driving to school two days a week just to make it to the gym for an early morning class and when we had an opportunity to kind of bump in salary. I bought my electric bike so that I could ride every day and that there was no reason not to ride to the gym and no reason not to ride across town to meet somebody. And it's been a fun transition. I at first was a little hesitant because I'm like a cyclist, you know, and I can do hills, um, but I can get home now and cook for myself and um, not feel exhausted. And I can arrive to school with a little bit of extra smile on my face because I'm not so tired. When you're on a long bicycle tour, you really don't know what's gonna happen next. You just know you have to keep moving forward. And you know that in order to keep a bicycle balanced, you just have to keep pedaling. And that analogy has been really valuable for me to take to heart through the pandemic, through remote teaching. I don't know what's gonna happen next. I don't think any of us do anymore. But we know that we have to keep moving forward on the things that matter. We know that the climate crisis isn't going away because we now have a healthcare pandemic. We have things that need to keep being moved forward on. And if we just keep pedaling, we are going to make progress. One of the things that I love most about my bicycle commute and just bicycling in general is that it makes me connected to our place on the planet and wherever I go, wherever I roam on two wheels. But it's that connection to the natural world, which is really important. It's something as an educator, I feel like we've lost. And it's something I think that I'm trying to bring to my students on a daily basis. And if my bicycle parked in the classroom is an important aspect of reminding them that we can be connected to nature by being out in it, then, then I've done a small, big thing. The bicycle is a vehicle for revolution. It's a vehicle for change. It's a vehicle for community. It's a vehicle for collaboration and sustainability. It allows us to be present in our place and it's just a lot of fun. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so you get to actually see a little inside scoop. Um, uh, of our school as well. And uh, as we kind of come back here, um, I just wanted, as Michelle said, I, I have been there a long time. So I'm nearly I'm 20 years at, at Eckstein um, and I've been biking the whole time. And my career's work with us adolescents um, and early adolescent students has really shown me student spirit for both their own independence and what they're craving. Um, and now more than ever, their interest in, um, in climate in a changing world. 
And so I've become this advocate for a population of students who are about 10 to 16 years old um, who cannot drive and um, who can't vote. And so they are, though, in the communities and in their neighborhoods, and they are biking to soccer practice and ice cream shops and going to friends' houses. And I have stepped up to kind of encourage them and encourage my own work um, to take care of them as citizens, cyclists, uh, and know that they can be here. Um, I've been uh, a resource for them, and I can um, provide them dry socks and dry t-shirts when they come in on a rainy day. Um, and uh, they've just a lot of fun themselves. Uh, turn up your microphones, or rather turn up your volume a little bit, because we're going to hear from one student about um, their dedication. Um, and uh, this kid's book bag is every day his Ortlieb roller bag. So. What made me want to bike to school is that my older brother always did it and it seemed really cool and fun and when I finally got to do it, it was super fun to bike up the same hill as me. Does that make you feel strong? Yeah. <laughs> and as Michelle said, we're up on the top of the hill and so kids either are pushing or feeling strong and independent. Um, as a school, we have won the Golden Pedal Award from Cascade Bicycle Club, as you can see um, on the right here. And then being on the inside and, and being that teacher, go ahead, Sarah, you can advance the next slide, is really about spreading it and building that culture in a middle school um, and how we kind of do that, how we create systems and opportunities for students and staff to consider the bike culture um, to be more present than it is. And one of the ways I do that is sort of nudge administration to make walking and biking uh, the default. So if they're going to remind families that there is an event and they tell them where to park, I'm encouraging them also to tell them where to park their bicycles. And Michelle has been a great advocate for that and helping us with our bike valets that are in the bike cage in the evenings. And as parents try to funnel out, we get these nice line of bicycles to kind of escape earlier than, and, than others. Um, it means being the liaison for really the whole community between parents and staff and our administration. Um, I'm the captain of a bike to work team. I'll wait for that school bell. Um, I'm the captain of a bike to work team and encouraging more and more um, staff to ride to school um, and offering them safe routes to schools as well. And I encourage those staff to come out to our events that we run with Michelle um, to our bike cage so that they can promote cycling and tell students that it's a lifestyle choice and a great way to get around town. I'm also helping to facilitate communication between parents and the PTSA um, for grants and other funding if they need that to be um, passed along. And so. As a school, we're becoming a biking school despite the fact that we're on the top of a hill. And so we are growing in momentum and rolling forward with that. And we're really lucky now that Sarah has joined in on the district to help kind of lev uh, leverage all the work that we've been doing um, and bring it more systemic to the rest of the district. So I'll let Sarah take over from here. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Jessica and Michelle. So I got to meet Jessica and Michelle when I first started at Seattle Public Schools last spring at their pancake breakfast. And it really is so moving to see great things like this happening at Eckstein and also other schools across the district, despite it being one of the toughest years in education in a long time. Um, so I wanted to start my section with data because I think a lot of people don't know about this particular resource. The Healthy Youth Survey is a statewide survey of 6th, 8th, and 10th, and 12th, 10th and 12th graders. And when I stumbled upon it, I was very happy to see that two of the survey questions are about walking and biking to school. So you might have this data for your district too. Um, you can check on the Healthy Youth Survey webpage to see. And I just couldn't help but include a screenshot of the webpage here. Um, the survey started in 2002, and as a bonus, the webpage is a time capsule to what websites looked like in that time <laughs> of our lives. I hope they never update it. Um, and you can see here 71% of Eckstein students are walking or um, biking to school. That's compared to about half across other schools in the district. So those are really great numbers. And I like to share that data because it makes walking and biking feel attainable. And I think people might be surprised by the number of kids who do in fact walk and bike to school. Like Jessica said, it's about making it feel like the default. 
um, my background is in public health, where you learn that one of the few effective ways to change behavior is to tell people what their neighbors are doing or what their peers are doing. So if people see the tide is shifting toward walking and biking, they'll be more likely to want to join. So my position at Seattle Public Schools is as a Safe Routes to School coordinator. Safe Routes to School is about improving infrastructure and supporting students to walk and bike to school. And usually Safe Routes to School coordinators are housed within city government. In my case, I get to work directly for Seattle Public Schools, while at the same time working really closely with the city. And I'm the only coordinator embedded in the district in Washington State, but there are others around the country. And in my case, the position is funded by the city of Seattle. And I just like to put that out there into the world because if you have decision-making or advocacy power, consider this model. Having someone embedded in the district means I get access to schools and students in a way that's generally harder for outside organizations. So, how do I bring this type of work that Michelle and Jessica are doing to other schools? Um, I work on both the district level and the individual level. On the district level, I try and normalize and celebrate walking and biking to school. An example of, of normalizing is the district had a transportation webpage that focused mainly on yellow school buses, while about 70% of the students in the district are not eligible for busing. So to start to fill that gap, I created a district webpage that's focused on walking and biking to school. Um, I'm also working with the city to get student input on the 20 year plan for Seattle transportation. And in this picture, you can see sixth graders building models of their ideal street for getting to school. We got to try this out in Jessica's classroom. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> and we'll take it to other schools to engage more students in planning. And my ro role is also focused on the school and sometimes individual level. Um, so I'm prioritizing hands-on support, like staffing events, starting walking school buses, helping people apply for grants, et cetera, at higher equity need schools. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to share is Seattle Public Schools partners with Cascade Bicycle Club. Thank you, Cascade. And with the Seattle Department of Transportation, thank you, SDOT, if any of you are here, um, to get kids on bikes in all third, fourth, and fifth grades during PE class. And that program is expanding to middle schools. And this photo is a pilot in a kindergarten class. And I challenge you to not feel hopeful <laughs> when you look at this photo of confident, and independent young writers. So thank you. That's the end of our piece. Yay. Okay, I guess that is Brian and I. That's our turn. Uh, I'm Amanda. I have a kiddo. I had a kiddo in the Kitsap County Central Kitsap School District. Um, and so I'm going to kind of tell the story of how we got to getting bicycling to happen at my kiddo's elementary school. Um, so Kitsap County is an odd place to be a bicyclist. It's a place where people want to ride. People travel to to ride. Long, beautiful, winding roads surrounded by trees covered by smells of blackberries, crisp shaded dirt, salty seaweed and fresh farmland, mm. while still being encapsulated by small but populated cities and suburbs, with a large portion of that population being military. While the roads are so tempting to take, to, to take two wheels to, they are also absolutely terrifying. In some of the city propers, like Bainbridge, Bremerton, Paulsbo, and Port Orchard, there have been a drive to build more bicycle infrastru infrastructure, but in the county, there is not. Most of the roads that one is able to travel, travel on by bike 
are main roads, which either have no shoulder, a gravel shoulder, a ridiculously high speed limit, or a slower speed limit that motor vehicles do not abide by. To top that off, because of the military presence, there are many people who move into the county from other states and don't think to look up the Washington state road laws. Many people are driving off of knowledge from other states' laws, which creates confusion when those vehicles are interacting with bicyclists. The road outside of my kiddo's school is called Pine Road. In Bremerton City proper, the speed limit on the road is 25 miles an hour with gravel shoulders and a dinky little bike route sign that's faded and bent. As you cross the cusp into unincorporated Kitsap County, unincorporated Bremerton slash Kitsap County, the speed limit changes to 35 miles an hour and still with the gravel shoulders but now no bike route signs. This is the portion of road outside Pinecrest Elementary School. Going north, it's a sleek downhill. Going south, it's a steep uphill. Drivers fly down that portion of the hill at speeds up to 55 miles per hour and probably faster. It's not bicycle friendly but it is the only way to get through this side of Bremerton without taking the freeway. This is why the school did not allow kids to ride bikes. The street half the kids get to school from is Pine Road. There was no, there was no way to guarantee that children would make it safely to school on their own and there are not many other parents who are willing to ride with their kids to school at this moment. When my kiddo was in kindergarten, I decided to see if I could get a safe routes to school for Pinecrest. A friend and I walked the neighborhoods asking people to sign a petition for safe routes to school and paved shoulders. Thinking enough of the community supporting this, we could get the county and the school district on board. We ended up having a meeting with the county commissioner, superintendent, former superintendent, school principal, head of the public works department, and the school district's financial person. All those fancy people in a room hearing out two parents, and still we didn't get a safe routes to school or paved shoulders. What a song and dance for nothing, right? For four years, I rode my box bike, a cargo bike with a wooden box usually on the front instead of kids on the back. I rode my box bike with my kiddo on their own bike, the mile and a half to school. The first time we rode to school, a driver called the sheriff on us claiming that they were worried for my child's safety. When in reality, my big bike in the middle of the lane inconvenienced them, so they called the cops. A deputy showed up and clearly didn't know the bicycle laws for Washington, which I, I did know. <laughs> this is the kind of mentality drivers in Kitsap County have. So after I would drop my kid off at school, I would load their bike into my box bike and take it home. And then at the end of the day, bring their bike back so that they could ride home from school. As the summer before third grade rolled in, I realized that their bike was getting too big to continue to move back and forth in this way. I emailed the principal, Bethany LaHaye, asking if putting in bike racks could be an option and if I could help make it happen. At first, it was an overwhelming idea, especially coming off of the COVID year and everyone teaching virtually and doing everything different. But at the end of the summer, I received an email from Beth saying 
she had thought about it all summer and she can see the benefits for giving kids the chance to bike to school. She wanted to help make this happen. So she and I met and we talked about what it would look like for the kids to ride to school off of Pine Road. She had huge concerns about those kids. And after some back and forth with ideas, we came up, we came to the conclusion to have a bicycle to have bicycle classes allowing kids grades three through five to ride their bikes to school. A lot needed to happen for this. I had no idea how to start putting together a curriculum for teaching a group of kids to ride in the road. Then I remembered I had met Brian on the ferry and that he is a bicycle instructor. I had lost his card and I scoured the internet to try and find his info when I finally found it at the Kitsap Co-op of all places. I emailed Brian and he was very interested in helping with this project. Things were in place, but still a long road to completion. That was in the fall. We still needed to get bike racks, which our PTA gifted us. They needed to be installed. A district committee needed to give the okay on our plan. We needed to send out permission slips, set dates, and get volunteers. And in the reality of all this, it would not have happened without the principal, Bethany LaHaye. I am only a parent, and luckily, I'm a persistent one at that. But Beth was open to the idea of bicycles to school and didn't just write me off, like maybe some other principals or staff members might. She supported my enthusiasm as a parent and getting parents to be enthusiastic about their kids' school is not, ne not easy nowadays. If she hadn't said yes, I'm sure, I'm not sure any of this would have happened within the district. I would have kept biking, with my kiddo, but other kids would not have been able to. Having school staff and parents that are enthusiastic about the benefits of riding bikes and walking to school for their kids is the most important piece here. We were so lucky that that staff member was the principal of the school. I'm not, I know I'm, I know not all principals are going to be on board with this, with a project like this. That is the missing piece, having a principal or staff member. Having the school district be open and willing to having, having a bicycle curriculum is the ideal and is where we want it to go with this. And with that, I'm going to send it off to Brian so that he can talk about what we actually did in the classes. Brian, are you ready? Brian, you're uh, you're still quiet. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Brian Watson. I use he, him pronouns, and I am, um, I run a little thing called Bicycle Teacher, and my website is bicycleteacher.com, and my specialty is teaching people how to safely and effectively use their bikes for whatever reason they want to, all ages, all abilities, no limits, and it was a great honor to be asked by Amanda to, uh, to uh, come up with a, uh, an educational program for Pinecrest Elementary. Um, as Amanda alluded to, uh, Pinecrest is a very different, is situated in a very different neighborhood than either Bryant Elementary or Eckstein Middle School. Um, I looked on a map just now, uh, Bryant and Eckstein both exist in um, a grid street pattern um in a fairly urban place which makes it ideal for walking and biking 
Um, and that's one reason I think they have such a high proportion of walkers and bikers to that school, in addition to the hard work of people like Michelle and Jessica, Sarah, and many others. Uh, Pinecrest Elementary, by contrast, exists on an arterial. It is not in a, a grid pattern. And I think that is a huge thing that we need to remember as we think about encouraging people to walk and bike to school is that not everybody exists in a, a, an, old an old style grid neighborhood. Um, a lot of people in Kitsap County uh, live in subdivisions that are connected by arterials and those arterials get a lot of heavy traffic and often um, quite speedy traffic as Amanda suggested. Um, my, my belief as a bicycling educator is that um, we can't wait for that utopia of paved shoulders, paved bike lanes, paved shared use paths to every doorstep. That utopia is a long way off. And honestly, I don't think it's even going to actually ever happen. <laughs> The point though, is that we don't have to wait for that. Um, bicycling education and pedestrian education is key to making it possible for children and adults to use their bicycles, um, use their feet, use their scooters to get around. Um, and part of, Part of what I try to do in bicycling education is transform the bicycle from a toy into a tool. Um, and I try to transform bicycling from um, a sport as only a sport into both a sport and a practical transportation method. Um, I think this is one thing that as bicyclists, we, we kind of forget sometimes. Um, and I think that it's important to, even as we enjoy bicycling for pleasure, that we also emphasize that it is a very practical transportation tool that ticks so many boxes for social and environmental goals that we have. So how to bring that to children, especially children who um, I don't know personally, I don't know their background as bicyclists. I don't know anything about them necessarily. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, Tamar, can you share my slideshow? Because this would be a good way to show those pictures. All right, thank you. So I, I chose this picture to start with because a lot of bicycling education starts and ends with giving kids helmets and putting it on putting helmets on kids maybe doing one fitting and then kind of sending them off and i think that's just i just think that's a real disservice to our children um this uh this particular student showed up with a, a very ill-fitting helmet as you can see uh, very blinged out with stickers. I must, I must commend her on that, but, but, <laughs> but uh, not very well fitted. Uh, so we spent. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So we spent uh, some time talking about helmets, of course, but then we also did. Here's another one. Um, again, she has a helmet, but it's not fitting very well. Go to the next slide. Um, so we spent uh, time before each session uh, reiterating helmet fit um, and how the bikes, how our bikes are, um, are performing. Uh, we actually had to spend quite a bit of time um, making sure everyone's bikes were okay to ride. Um, like uh, someone else said, a lot of these bikes have been sitting in garages untouched for years. So the tires are flat, the brakes don't work, chain is barely working, et cetera, et cetera. Again, this is, this is assuming that the bicycle is a toy rather than a tool. And um, 
So we, uh, thank goodness, had many, many people who I recruited from the West Sound Cycling Club to come. And uh, uh, people like Bill Abbey, um, Bob Newbill, Janet Onspach, um, myself, uh, Amanda, we spent time before we even got on our bikes fixing them as best we could given the limited amount of uh, tools and materials that we had. Uh, this is one thing that I think needs to be part of any bike education program is um, some partnership with professionals who can do um, thorough bike checks and, and bike fixes at little to no cost. Because um, a lot of parents, especially in our area, they're just stretched. They don't have a lot of money for taking their bikes to bike shops. So that's something that schools, I believe, ought to be doing. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so the first thing we did, this is a picture of Amanda on her box bike. And you can see the big box in the front, in front of her. And she's got this wonderful sign on the back of her bike that reminds motorists of uh, our RCWs, which I love. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Um, so the first couple sessions, uh, well, the, let me just back up a step. The, the, way, it, the way I structured this, this program was to break it up to four sessions on the early release days. So these were after school classes. These were not being done in the physical education uh, classes. We only had about, I would say, 10 kids at the most. And, um, um, and so we, we had a nice small group of kids who we could really spend a lot of time with. The first couple sessions we spent only in on the school grounds in their, par, in their uh, playground area. Uh, working on bike handling skills. Um, bike handling is absolutely essential to safe riding. And kids come with all kinds of different levels of bicycling skill. Um, most of them come thinking they know everything already. <laughs> um, but uh, it's pretty clear uh, just watching them for just a few seconds that a lot of them have a lot to learn still. And that's fine. Uh, that's what I do as a bicycling educator. Um, so we spent uh, the first two sessions just working on things like uh, what Amanda is showing here, looking over our shoulder, which is a critical skill if you're going to be riding on an arterial and you might need to change uh, your lane position or change lanes. Uh, we worked on things like starting, stopping, uh, turning, looking over our shoulders, uh, riding with one hand off the handlebars, uh, giving turn signals, um, and, and learning the rules of the road on the playground and in the uh, also in the parking lot area of the school. Um, this time also gave me a lot of time to assess where kids were at um, in terms of whether they had the situational awareness. Um, skills necessary to go out onto the road. Um, I had already structured the class so that kids who needed more time to practice basic bike handling skills in the parking lot uh, or playground could do that with volunteers, with adult volunteers, while other kids went with other volunteers and me onto streets. So this is another aspect of the program that is unique to my approach in that I, I don't believe in failure as a concept. I believe that everyone can be successful given enough time and practice. And um, so instead of just expecting everybody to go along uh, in a f uh, assembly line fashion, I deliberately structured the sessions so that kids could have more time to improve their skills um, and and uh, to differentiate among them. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is me um, uh, with the, some of the students gathered around. Um, 
I want to just point out a couple of things. Um, one, you see everybody wearing a, a safety vest. Um, that's something that I encourage all my students to wear, adults and children alike. And the, uh, I believe the school PTA paid for these nice kid-sized safety vests, um, which are high-vis green with reflective um, striping on them. Um, so this is a picture of me doing a chalk drawing on the pavement. Uh, we're here in the playground or parking lot area of the school. And on this particular day, we were learning the rules of the road um, in a place where there weren't, wasn't other traffic. Um, uh, so that if kids made a mistake, it wasn't going to be um, a dangerous situation for them. Um, it's a very difficult thing to teach rules of the road when you're not actually on a road. So I did as much as I could to try to make it look as much like a road as possible. And using a chalk diagram like this um, helped, helped teach kids uh, these concepts. Next slide. Um, in the third session, we went to an adjacent subdivision, which is connected to the school uh, by a uh, shared use path. So this is a this is a nice feature of this subdivision, um, and it's kind of a rare thing in Kitsap County. Uh, there, but the kids who live in this subdivision can access the, Pi the Pinecrest School campus without having to get on the arterial. They can go directly from this subdivision to a shared use path and to the school grounds. Uh, so we used this subdivision and it's very quiet streets. Um, uh, these very quiet streets uh, to teach the rules of the road in a guided piloted fashion. So what you see in this image are students um, riding on the right, and then you see pilots or adult volunteers to the student's left. So each adult had one, two, maybe three students who they were piloting, and we could um, give them very direct instruction, monitor them in real time, um, and teach them things like ride on the right side of the road, stop at intersections, yield to cross traffic, yield before entering a road, um, make sure you can see both directions, um, uh, signal your turns, uh, look over your shoulder if you need to make a turn or a lane change. Again, this was taking the skills that we had learned in the previous week in the parking lot and put, putting them into a real world context with on a real road with some very little real traffic. Um, and I was really happy to see all the kids um, do, do very well and, and not just learn about the rules of the road from a worksheet or something or a video, but actually to put them into practice. All right, uh, next slide. And I see Vicki is cutting me off. So I'll just finish up here. Well, let's just go through a couple more if we would, and then I'll finish up. Go ahead, next, next. So when we uh, went out onto the actual arterial of Pine Road, uh, we rode uh, to abreast um, and then uh, it went in a group. Good, next slide. And then each volunteer took one student to pilot that student back to Pinecrest, a ride of about maybe two miles. So here I am with one student. I'm riding to that student's left and I'm, and I'm behind the student. So I could see exactly what they were doing the whole time. You can see another pilot student pair behind me down the road a piece. This is a really effective model, and it's one that I would um, I, I would definitely use again. Um, and it gave the kids a sense of being alone on the road, even though they weren't. Um, I think that bicycling education is a is a very 
important part of getting kids to ride and walk to school. We have to make it a priority in terms of funding um, because I did this whole program as a volunteer, as did Amanda, as did all the people from West Sound Cycling Club who participated. That's great for one-offs. It's great for so those of you who are in policy positions, hear me out. We need money. We need to train bicycling educators using the models that I've developed um, and other models that have proven effective. And we need to um, we need to get uh, these these paid professionals into our schools. Um, okay, I'm going to hand it off to Vicky. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, to uh, Brian, Amanda, uh, Sarah, Michelle, and Jessica. Yeah, I, I do want to underscore before we get to questions just how uh, how different uh, these two contexts are. I'm currently a resident of Kitsap County, and I used to live in Northeast Seattle, and I, they are worlds apart in terms of um, uh, geography, culture, uh, <laughs> um, density. So thank you for just sharing those two very different experiences. Um, I want to do some rapid fire questions. While I'm queuing up the first question, I, I, I do want to invite all the speakers to post your information in the chat. I don't know that we're going to get to all these questions and there, there are some really good ones that I think uh, folks should follow up with these awesome experts. Um, and so I, I guess I want to start with uh, Jessica and Sarah. Do you have any resources that um, for the that you use for the biking or staff use for the biking challenges? Do you use Cascades Bike Everywhere platform? Do you, uh, do you have posters, email templates that um, you can share or that uh, you use as a resource? Sure, I can answer that. Um, I think we were one of the longest running teams. We've been through the bike to work month and we are the no teacher left behind the steering wheel team. Um, and so, uh, which is great. Um, and so it's shifted and morphed into the platform that we do know now is the bike everywhere. And uh, we're mostly using that. Um, and uh, we appreciate that, that it's actually taken off in a more sort of community space where now the <clears throat> Seattle Public Schools can register as a company and then our sort of individual schools. And so we can compete within, with, with schools on the platform, but we used to just sort of send that out um, to each other. Uh, I have sort of cross commutes with many colleagues uh, who live, I live in the South End and teach up North. People live in the North End and teach down South. And we always say hello and, and see each other on the bike rides. And we've been sort of um, in friendly competition for years there, but now the platform allows us to do that as well. Um, as far as students, Students uh, encouraging them to come in. We do have lots of graphics. We put up um, posters and flyers in the hallways at school in front of the bike cage. We put them in our community bulletins and our parent bulletins um, and uh, announce it in our Eagle News, uh, which is the student newsletter and this like student announcements so that kids know when the next bike to school event is uh, or the next biker donut day is or the bike to school breakfast. Um, and we can make some of those things available. It's typically just been a parent volunteer and now with more cool graphic programs, we can jump onto those as well, so. Okay, switching gears, big big picture. How do we move, this is a hard one, how do we move this work forward if there isn't a consistent and sustained force like Jessica or Beth to maintain momentum and support? I think that's what you, what, um, you know, Amanda and, and Brian were speaking to, right? How, how do we do this? Anyone? Can you? I, it it seems I, hard. I can speak. I could speak to that because it's been a frustration for me over here in Kitsap County uh, to see the wonderful programs that Cascade is doing in uh, the Seattle area, and you know we have to kind of cobble together things over here as catch as catch can. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of money that kind of legislate recently uh, for bicycling and pedestrian education and really if we want things to work we have to pay for them we don't expect teachers uh, or excuse me we don't expect other professionals to work for free we shouldn't expect bicycling educators to work for free too um, this needs sustained funding and and um, and a prioritization on the part of um, uh, district level uh, leaders uh, uh, supported from the state um, 
uh, from WashDOT, from uh, other other organizations, departments of health, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a global overheating crisis. We've got a kid's health crisis going on. This bicycling, walking is a big part of the answer to, to all of these problems that we face uh -huh. and we yeah. need money to do it. So, okay, so that leads me to the next question. Uh, how did funding for Sarah's position come about? And, oh, Sarah, how do you, do you have any advice for how it could be replicated? Yeah, replicate it. Um, it started, my understanding, and if others know more on this, please, please jump in. Um, but I think it started with the um, School Traffic Safety Committee, which is a group of mostly parent volunteers and also agency representatives who advise on traffic safety around schools. And um, they advocated with the Seattle City Council to get funding for someone dedicated within Seattle Public Schools to do this work. And they um, had a sympathetic ear in, in Seattle City Council, I think it was Mike O'Brien, um, who said, yeah, let's do it, let's get this in the budget. And so it's now in the Seattle City Council budget and it goes to Seattle Department of Transportation. And it's a MOA between SDOT and Seattle Public Schools. That's great. Thank you. And thank you for that reminder. I'd kind of forgotten that too. And I posted in the chat the link to the committee that Sarah just referenced because I think um, you know, something I've seen in advocacy is like being able like starting, like starting with a bike pad advisory committee tr trickles down um to policy change and so um maybe that you know a as other communities are thinking about how they how they replicate maybe it is even a step back from getting sarah's position right it's a it's a, it's an advisory committee that is ongoing and that has um responsibility to advise decision makers um so thank you for that sarah um i want to jump back to Another question that I've lost. Um, okay, so there's another question about, I'm just going to read it. Uh, are there any school districts spending for walk bike safety like they do for busing? <laughs> um, I, I have six, the, right. Sure, uh, chuckle. <laughs> uh, go on. No, I, I mean, I also, as much as education is for the walking and biking safety, I also believe there's a need for parent education to release control of their children in cars. Um, and I think that we need to see those two things happening together. And so while we mentioned the geography of Eckstein um, here up on a hill, we also very rainy and we are also having families who just coddle children. And we are, I, in my career, as I've seen this big shift, I mean, Eckstein was built in the 1950s with a dedicated bike cage. That's how long ago that we had a motion and an idea that children could bike to school. And that is rapidly decreased as the temperatures of the climate have increased and our carbon consumption has increased. And if we look at how we can have parent education as much as we have the children's bike education, I think we can reach some sort of limit. So again, as Brian sort of talks about all the funding needed here, I also think that community advocates need to think about parent education um, so that we can reach that middle ground together. Well said. And also, I, I, I don't know anything about this topic, but I do know that the, there are perverse incentives, right? The incentive for school for the schools to get folk, get kids onto the buses so that they get the money for the buses. And instead of thinking about, um, I can say this because I don't work for a school district, uh, instead of thinking about what is the potentially the best way for kids to be getting to school. Um, uh, I think there's a couple more questions in the chat and I'm sorry, we are out of time. I, I want to thank all of you awesome speakers for being with us, for the work that you do day to day. Um, you're clearly making an impact on, on our kids' lives, on, on our future, right? Um, and so thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Our next housekeeping, our next session is posted in the chat somewhere and is later this afternoon what a terrible answer from your moderator um and uh there is also somewhere in the chat there is a um a feedback form so our next session is at 3 p.m retrofitting urban arterials thank you um again thank you all for your time i wish you a good rest of your day thank you